listening to Leah talk, I was just kind of like between tears and speechless and amazed and thinking about um, the path that we walk as activists, the path we walk as healers, the path we walk as making a contribution, sometimes banging our heads against walls of big systems that we're trying to change, and thinking, wow, does that chick ever sleep? But a lot of my work really is about helping people who are doing this kind of work do it for the long run. When I was in medical school, by the time I was in my third year of residency, I had gained almost 10 pounds, which doesn't sound like maybe a lot, but on my frame, that's like 8, 10% of my body weight. Um, I had a horrible rash that wouldn't go away. Uh, it was under my left breast. It was constant. It was so bad that my skin had turned purple from scratching. I had it on my lower back. It was waking me up at night. I started wearing reading glasses from the strain of lack of sleep because I was doing these you know, perpetual 30-hour overnight shifts a um, couple of times a week. Had one day off a month on a weekend. You know, we had these what we call black weekends, golden weekends. Golden weekend was when you got one day off on the weekend a month. And then I got really sick. Um, I ended up having um, a waking up. Well, what happened was a bunch of us in our residency program got a bronchial infection. We were coughing. We had fevers. And they were lingering for, you know, a week or two. And then mine just kept lingering. And I was running fevers. I was in the clinic pushing myself to go and go and go and go. Because as doctors, and this isn't just my profession, but a lot of professions where we're doing service work, we don't take time off. There's actually a lot of literature coming out right now. Should doctors take sick days? It's actually a question because doctors show up. <laughs> your doctor could show up and get you sick because doctors show up at work sick all the time. But I had crossed the line from a little bit sick to a lot sick. And I woke up in the, one, in the middle of the night one night, and I had to urinate. And I kid you not when it said, if I can imagine what peeing out steak knives felt like, I was peeing out steak knives. I had a high fever. I had lower back pain. And when I looked in the toilet, there was a lot of blood. So I called up my residency the next morning. I said, I'm sick, and I really can't come in. And my residency director actually said, well, if you think you're sick, you need to get a doctor's note and prove it. <laughs> yeah. So I went to the clinic, not my clinic, but I went and saw one of my preceptors, who was one of my, my teachers, and got a urinary, you know, got urinalysis, and um, she checked my temperature. My blood pressure was like 70 over 40. Um, I was really, I wasn't quite septic, where you like have full blood infection, but I was sick enough that she said, I really want to put you in the hospital. I had a kidney infection. I'd never had an infection like that in my life. I hadn't even taken an antibiotic since I was 15 years old, and I was in my early 40s because I went back to med school after this long career as a home birth midwife and an herbalist and an author. So there I was, hadn't taken an antibiotic, was thinking about going, whether I should go to the hospital, but there I was, a resident, so I really couldn't take three days off to go get IV antibi antibiotics, so I promised I would take my 10 days of Cipro, and I did. This is really common in medicine, but it's also really common in, in helping professions that we don't take care of ourselves. For me, I got off kind of easily, easily as a resident. I got a kidney infection, but a lot of doctors end up with alcohol addiction, drug addiction, and we're a pretty high profession for suicide. In fact, women doctors are the most likely population to suicide amongst women in the United States. Pretty, pretty impressive, isn't it? Because we don't take time off. Well, it's not just medical residents that are living under this chronic go, go, go. And um, it's, it's most Americans are actually living under this chronic go, go, go. And the reason I have this picture here of this tiger chasing a person is because we all are living in our culture in this chronic state of fight or flight. How many of you are either in a volunteer work or an NGO or some kind of serving profession? And how many of you maybe, let's just say, once a month experience a feeling of overwhelm? Yeah, pretty much everybody. How about once a week feeling some overwhelm? Yeah. 73% of Americans feel, cra yeah, you're laughing, it's, it's true, it's like a really big problem. 73% of Americans feel overwhelmed almost all the time. Now, the problem with overwhelm is it's not just an emotion that we experience, it's actually a whole series of biological problems. And the biological problems 
that, that happen as a result include things like packing weight around our middle. So we gain belly fat. And the reason and that, that eight or 10 pounds I gained in residency was literally all around my waist. What happens is that from an evolutionary perspective, our bodies are hardwired to save energy when we're anticipating an emergency. And when we're living in this chronic overwhelm, it's telling our primitive lizard evolutionary biological brain that we're in a state of emergency. So I call this SOS, or survival overdrive syndrome. So we pack weight around our middle, but it's not just flubber that's sitting there giving us muffin tops. It's actually inflammatory cells that cause changes in our blood pressure, in our blood sugar, in our stress hormones, in our sex hormones. So downstream, this effect can lead to high blood pressure, diabetes, and guess what? Where is the stress the highest in our culture? In the lowest, most struggling socioeconomic communities. So we're all affected by it, but it's having an impact in some communities even more than others. So the direction we're heading in right now, based on this overwhelm and this stress in our society that is so rampant, that check it out. There was a study that just came out this past year that showed kids under the age of two in the United States, 186,000. Get this, 186,000 kids under two in the United States are on some kind of medication for depression or anxiety. Yeah. Now, some of this is over-medication and over-diagnosis, but the sad reality, it's not all. We're living in this pool and sea of anxiety and stress. And what's happening is, this is an actual photograph of a 12-year-old boy. Right now, we have about one in three kids who is not just uh, a little bit overweight, but obese. By 2020, it's expected that one in two Americans will be, will be obese, and as many as one in three will have diabetes. Now, diabetes isn't just a blood sugar problem. It's a disease that by the time people are in their 50s and 60s, they're losing their eyesight, they're having way more risk of heart attack than the rest of the population. Now keep in mind, this is like one in three Americans by 2020. That's four years and three months from now, something like that. Um, depression and anxiety are higher in obese populations because of those same inflammatory cells. Depression is higher in diabetics because of the management and the blood sugar ups and downs. And not just that, but we're having a lot of other problems that we're seeing escalating. Like one in four kids under the age of five now has some form of food allergy. So they have to restrict their food because of these inflammatory changes that are happening as a result of some of these stresses that we're exposed to. And stress isn't just emotional stress. There's a lot of stress in our society, things that we're being exposed to. Chemicals in our food, chemicals in our environment, on and on and on. Even things that we're seeing in the news, things that we're reading on TV. So this is the seeing on TV. Um, these, this is the direction that we're heading in. Now, I think a lot of us, um, especially in the helping profession, and I think this is a lot of why doctors don't take days off, is we, have, we pride ourselves. Like some of us even get self-worth and self-value. Like how many times have you ever gone to a party? Just raise your hand. If you're like in a conversation where people are like, well, I work this many hours and I work, and I'm so tired because I'm working all the time. Or I can't, do you, do you hear that phenomenon? Like people, yes, right? And it's really high in our professions, actually. It's really high in helping professions. For whatever reason, we tend to get a lot of self-worth over working really hard and proving how hard we're working. Now there's a lot of work to be done. But I figure if Audrey Lord can say that caring for herself is not an act of self-indulgence, it's an act of self-preservation, then I figure we can cut ourselves a little slack and do a little bit of self-preservation. But even more than that, in taking care of ourselves and preventing ourselves from becoming part of the victimization of the stresses of our society, we're actually going for the long haul. So I would like to posit to you that it's your personal responsibility, it's our social responsibility to actually take care of ourselves and not contribute to the problem of the billions of dollars that are being spent. You know, the actual um, annual budget that's being spent by the federal government right now on diabetes alone is more than the entire National Institutes of Health combined budget 
for everything. So by taking care of ourselves, it's not only a radical act of, of self-preservation, it's a radical act of social warfare because we're not contributing to the pharmaceutical companies that are holding Americans by the balls when they get sick. I mean, going into illness is one of the single biggest tippers into poverty and worsening of poverty in this country for people. And it's not being part of that medical industrial complex. But it's also about us being able to go for the long run. So what I want to do is give you guys nine basic hacks that you can use to take care of yourself so you can actually have endurance for the long run. So, you know, I'm always amazed at what I can find on Google. I was giving a talk one night, and I was like, I want to call this Taming the Tiger, you know, hearkening back to that first tiger. And the way that tiger, that sort of Neanderthal tiger, came up is that people, when they talk about stress response and stress physiology, they talk about this idea that we're, like, these, these um, mechanisms are hardwired for survival over these millennia, over this evolutionary biology. So the idea is that you could outrun a saber-toothed tiger, or at least outrun the guy next to you trying to outrun a saber-toothed tiger. So I thought, okay, well, what could I do taming the tiger? And so I Googled taming the tiger one night, and I actually found that it's this entire Buddhist concept. And this is a real picture of a monk in Tibet where these people work to tame tigers as part of their own sort of like, they're helping to create preserves for tigers to live on when they're endangered, but also creating co-relationship. And so what I want to emphasize also is that stress isn't all bad. Stress is actually a primary motivator. The stresses that we see in society motivate us to make change. When we have stress in our own lives, it should motivate us to make change. A little bit of stress actually can improve your immune system. It can improve your concentration. So it's finding that relationship with stress that brings you to your peak performance without making you sick. So what I want to share with you today is that stress can be hacked. You can actually use stress to your positive benefit, but also stay in that place where it doesn't tip you over into peeing out steak knives or ending up diabetic or any other consequence that can affect you in the long run. So this is what I call finding your U zone. This curve right here is actually called the Yerkes-Dodson curve. And what happens is if you're under, so this is a perf stress on the x-axis, performance on the y-axis. So if you can see at the very low end of the curve here, if you're understimulated, and we see this in communities where kids are not having the resources to be read to or talked to enough or don't get enough food to stimulate development, there's an actual understimulation. There's an understimulation mentally, n nutritionally. It affects growth, it affects behavior, it affects personal choice. That keeps performance really low. And it is definitely one of the ways that our society sub subjugates socioeconomic communities. But also on this other end, whether you're under a lot of social stress in your community or whether you're under a lot of stress in your own life, it also decreases your performance. So for us to be actually functioning in the highest way possible, maximizing performance in our lives, I encourage people to find what I call the U zone. And that U zone is that sweet, sort of sweet zone. And I don't call it a sweet spot because there's not really one spot of optimal stress reduction in life. Like it's never perfect. You know, when you were a kid, if you ever stood on like a, a teeter-totter, a seesaw, it's not like you ever reach perfect balance for very long. There's always that recalibration. And in truth, that's what life is, right? There's a little bit of stress. There's a little bit of relaxation. But what I want you to think about is being in this zone right here where you're optimally stimulated in your life but you're not crossing over into this place. Now how do you get there? I think most of us actually know when we're in that place. Like how many of you have just said yes to something and, and as soon as it comes out of your mouth you're like, oh my God, I just crossed the line of where I've taken on too much. Has that ever happening? Right, all the time, especially if you're doing volunteer work or working in an organization that you really are trying to make change. 
But when we're in that space where we're taking on too many things at one time, in truth, the theories of multitasking have shown that multitasking is actually one of the least effective ways to get things done. So what I recommend is two things. One, really paying attention to your body because most of us know in our bodies, it's actually usually a visceral, physical feeling. Some people feel it in their throat. They say yes, and then they're like, ooh, they tighten up. Or they feel it in their gut, or they f their digestion is off. Or you get a headache, or you can't sleep because you're laying at night thinking, why did I say yes to that? When am I going to do it? And how can I back out? And most of us are pretty responsible, so we don't back out, and we just keep too many things on our plate at one time. But ultimately, we do have to pay the piper for that, and that's what I want you to be able to not do. So it's two things. One is listening to what is really going on in your body. Another thing is learning to make a priorities list. What are the five things? And, and you're probably even starting to think about that as I'm saying it right now. What are the five things that you really, really have to do right now? Maybe in the next six weeks. Maybe it's two weeks. Maybe it's three months. And how do you take those other eight things and instead of having them all on you at once, be kind of like what I jokingly call a serial monogamist with your projects. Instead of having a lot of projects at once, space them out. So pick the top three or the top five that you can really do and do well and feel good about and feel good and peaceful in your own body about them, not like you have this constant motor running. And then pace yourself. Another thing is to work smart, and I call it the work smart 25. Now, what we know from studies of neurobiology is that once we work past our most effective work concentration time, everything else is diminishing returns. And so a lot of organizations, Google is a famous example of this, Mind Valley is another one, actually suggest people work in increments of a varying amount of time. I will tell you that in, at Yale Medical School, when I started there, classes were 50 minutes long. And, and, if, and even for people who are at Yale Medical School who have a pretty high level of concentration and a pretty long attention span, for the most part, um, what they did was they actually reduced the class length to 25 minutes because that was found to be really the optimal concentration time. So everyone has their own sweet zone of what their time is. My time is 45 minutes. But find out what your time is. Start to pay attention to when you're doing your work and then you're starting to think of checking your email or checking the internet or surfing for something or looking for something that you were thinking that you wanted to buy or who you want to call or what distraction it is because that distraction time is actually your brain's natural rhythm. So instead of ignoring it and pushing past it or letting yourself get distracted and then trying to get back to your work, which is not effective, most people lose about 20 minutes of time trying to get back to their work, actually set calculated amounts of time. So for me, when I'm doing a, like some kind of a concentrated work, I actually set a 45 minute, I, I mean, I don't have to set the time anymore because now I know what it is, but initially I would set a 45 minute timer. I'd give myself 45 minutes, no distraction. And what's amazing is your, your brain will rehabituate to 45 minutes of really effective work and then give yourself a 15 or 20 minute break get up, go outside, do something refresh refreshing, do some yoga, take a minute, go surf the internet, buy that thing, you can't stop thinking about whatever it is you need to do, and then come back to your work. You'll get so much more bang for your buck. Okay, this is not exactly what it looks like, although that can be good too. A quickie is my misinterpretation of a word that I was told for a meditation. You see where my mind goes. I was in a, a five-day um, mind-body intensive at Harvard University, Harvard Medical School, and they, they called it something else. When I went back, it was actually like the Swifty or something, but I called it the Quickie. So I'm actually going to have you just do this really quick with me. Put your feet on the ground, and if you can, you can leave your eyes open or leave your eyes closed. Just put your feet on the ground. Hands in your lap. If you fall asleep, I forgive you. I know it's not me. And what I want you to do is just take a normal deep breath. You can put your things in your lap if it's too disruptive to move everything else. Just put your things in your lap. You can do this anywhere. You can do this in a grocery workout if somebody in front of you just feels like they're taking too long and you're starting to curse in your head. You can do this in traffic. You can do this in a meeting. If you do it in traffic, please do it with your eyes open. Okay. Deep breaths, just a few normal deep breaths. In through your nose, out through your mouth. 
And then on the next inhale, count to four in your mind and at the same time say to yourself, I am. I am. And then exhale to the count of four at peace. Inhale, count of four, I am, exhale, at peace. Inhale, count of four, I am, exhale, count of four, at peace. And then just do that twice more on your own. Now when you're ready, open your eyes. Can you feel that? Yeah. It's amazing doing that if you're about to go in for a board meeting, a stressful meeting, if you're about to take an exam, in the middle of an exam. Anytime you're feeling it can completely rewire your sympathetic overdrive, that fight or flight, into a more parasympathetic it relaxes your blood vessels so it can help offset that high blood pressure. It, rela it shifts you out of that fight or flight which is driving high glucose and pushing you in that pre-diabetic or diabetic direction. It's amazing what it can shift, just something that simple. Doing it in a group, powerful. And it's, it's non-denominational. I've done it with executives. I've done it in board meetings. Super powerful. I can really shift things to keep them on track or when things are getting tough or when there are disagreements, it can really reharmonize a group. So you really do need sleep. You're gonna see a lot of studies in the literature going back and forth on whether you need seven hours of sleep or whether people can get away with five or six hours of sleep. There are about 2% of people that do seem to be able to get away without sleeping more than five or six hours a night, but that's the rare majority. And a lot of long-term studies haven't been done on those people. But what we do know is that when you're not sleeping enough, not sleeping well, it drives that stress hormone called cortisol really high. And what cortisol does is really interesting. When you're exposed to it over time, not only is it the hormone that makes you pack on that weight around your middle and makes your blood pressure go up and makes your blood sugar go all crazy, but it actually offsets the effectiveness of your frontal cortex. Does anybody know what the job of the frontal cortex is? There's a term that's associated with. Yeah, executive function. So what's really, really interesting is when we're exposed to this chronic cortisol, it actually breaks your, your, breaks your ability to use your executive function, and it puts you into this primal reactionary mode. So it makes you reactive, not proactive. It also completely cuts off your willpower. So if you're under stress all the time and you're trying to follow a diet, or you're trying to be disciplined about something and you're finding that you can't, it's because this system is probably overriding it. It's keeping you primal. It's keeping you, and, and not primal in a, good way connected to your roots way, primal in a like reactive, I can't control my emotional reaction, I can't control what I eat because it's gonna be driving you to survival all the time. So sleeping a, at least seven hours most nights is actually that sweet zone that keeps that cortisol balanced. It'll make you feel better the next day. And if you think you're one of those 2% of people that can sleep on only five or six can thrive and function on only five or six hours a night, what I would challenge you to do is actually spend about 10 days sleeping seven hours a night and see what happens. And see at the end of that if you still think you're one of those people. <laughs> okay, feed your head. I don't mean mushrooms and stuff like that. What I mean is that when our brains are sabotaged by constant stress, they're also under constant inflammation. And that constant inflammation can be contributing to that poor willpower, that poor executive function, but in the long run, it actually can contribute to cognitive problems and cognitive decline and even dementia. So we're talking about activists going for the long haul here. We're talking about living long, healthy lives. I think about people like Wendell Berry and, and Helen and Scott Nearing, these people who are like, you know, kicking it into their 90s, still doing activist work. That's how I want to be. And so the one single thing that you can do most importantly to feed your head is actually keep your blood sugar steady. 
So if you're living on coffee and living on danishes or skipping meals or skipping breakfast, you're probably not keeping your blood sugar steady. And that level of inflammation can creep up over time. So super simple, one, pay attention to how your body feels and eat when you're hungry and eat only foods that give you good nourishment and start your day with a good breakfast. So I'm not gonna go into a whole bunch about food right now because we're gonna talk about that in my workshop this afternoon. But what I wanna say is junk food, food, I don't even call it junk food anymore, I call it non-food junk. I can't even call it food anymore. But non-food junk, anything that has empty calories, lots of white flour, lots of white sugar, is gonna make your blood sugar go like this, up and down. And what you wanna do is keep it really steady. And the foods that keep it really steady are good quality fats, like olive oil, coconut oil, walnut oil, nuts, avocados, and really good quality protein, which you can do vegetarian or you can do meat-based. But that's what you wanna make sure you're getting at every single meal, a good quality protein and a good quality fat. And then if you're hungry for snacks, make sure that you're getting a snack that's also a good quality protein or a good quality fat. And then the rest is all vegetables and some fruit. But that will keep your cognitive function really steady throughout the day. It's gonna give you the most bang for your buck in your work, you're not gonna get these blood sugar drops and you're not gonna have times of day anymore where you feel like you're fading out, you're tired, you're dragging, you can't concentrate, you can't focus, and you just have to have a cup of coffee or something sweet at three o'clock in the afternoon to get through the rest of the day. So this is gonna give you a lot more fuel for your work. I wanna add in a word about the Mediterranean diet. It's a simple way of eating. There are a lot of diet books out there. There's a lot of information out there. There's only one way of eating that has actually been proven to prevent diabetes, prevent heart disease, prevent obesity, and reverse it. And it's a really simple practice of eating the good quality proteins, the good quality fats, lots and lots of vegetables, minimal dairy, no junk food, and, and really just keeping it steady throughout the day. And what happens is, is it cools down that inflammation in your system. So thinking about keeping your diet simple, what's really interesting is there isn't anything that's truly the Mediterranean diet. And what's been found is that what is called the Mediterranean diet that's actually beneficial is what was a post-World War II, um, really the lowest income subsistence farmers were eating lots of legumes, olives and olive oil from their land, local wild, wild harvested greens, greens from their garden, simple foods rather than heavy extravagant fare. And I would add to that that cooking at home and eating your own food, even if it's a little bit more work and requires you to learn to do a little meal planning and bring your work, bring your food to work, is really a revolutionary act because it will prevent, as a culture, it will start to prevent these downstream effects that are having just an enormous impact on us and our kids. Okay, hack number seven is don't go it alone. So one of the stress responses that we know we have is this fight or flight, and it pumps out all this adrenaline, and it pumps out all this cortisol. But has anybody heard of oxytocin? Yeah, what is it called? the love hormone, right, the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. What's really interesting is that as we pump out stress hormones, we also are supposed to be pumping out oxytocin. Now for a variety of reasons, not everybody has developed a lot of oxytocin receptors. You know, oxytocin receptors are actually upregulated. We produce more of them when we are connecting with each other. I spent a month in Haiti, actually after I got sick. I was doing medical work in Haiti, and when I was there, I was in, you know, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, one of the poorest in the world. I was doing obstetrics work in a community that has about 800 maternal deaths per 100,000, which is astronomical. It's one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. But in spite of this incredible, um, almost undescribable level of poverty, everywhere I walked, everywhere I walked, bonjour, bonsoir, I had a doctor once walk halfway up a street to come hold my hand and walk with me to the hospital, a Haitian doctor. Everyone connects, everyone connects. I came back to the States, I'm one of these people who like says hi to people on the street, and I was walking up the street and I noticed like everyone's face is in their iPhone, people don't look at each other, and when they do and you smile at someone, it's almost like they think like, what is wrong with that person? <laughs> Like there's a level of mistrust around connection. And yet it's this very connection, this very social, nurture, so, social nurturing 
that upregulates that oxytocin that counteracts all those horrible stress effects in our body. There was a woman, there is a woman named Shelley Taylor. She's a researcher on the stress response, particularly in women. And what she found is that if we enact something called the tend and befriend instead of the fight or flight, we actually upregulate our oxytocin. So when you're stressed out, calling a friend and just connecting, talking to someone in the hallway at work, it's not only, I see these two girls here like, ah, patting each other on the shoulder, I love it. Um, it, it actually can, so when, when you say a friend is a lifeline, a friend truly is a lifeline. It can be anyone. It can be someone you talk to on the street. It could be someone you talk to sitting next to, to you, but especially if you call a friend. And if you're actually really super stressed out, here's an even second benefit of it. Studies around PTSD and returning soldiers have found that just the act of talking about stress can massively bring down your stress hormones, can massively bring down your blood pressure, can start to put you back into that parasympathetic nurtured mode rather than in this overdrive mode. So don't go it alone, reach out. I wanna share two more thoughts and then a little bonus. One is to return to some of our original medicines. In cultures that have had traditional medicine, unbroken or nearly unbroken histories of traditional medicine for things like 5,000 years, there are certain medicines that are very highly prized. I'm sure you've heard of ginseng. This category of herbs is called adaptogens. And they're some of the most prized medicines, but not all of them are like, you know, $100,000 a root like ginseng, although ginseng can be cultivated and purchased much more affordably. But this group of herbs called adaptogens helps us literally physically adapt to stress, build our resilience, bring down that cortisol, regulate our blood sugar, support our immune system. Sound like a miracle, but they really do. And the research on thousands of studies has been shown that using these herbs as part of your daily health program, just like you would a food, and I like to think about herbs as kind of foods 2.0, Right? I mean, they're foods, they grow on the ground, they're plants, but they just have some more secondary chemicals than let's say an apple or collard greens or kale do. But they're still really um, an extension of our plant world, so I don't think of them as a pharmaceutical. There are herbs I do think of that way, but not these. So some of the, these are some of my top favorites that I'm sharing with you here. Eleuthero, ginseng, rhodiola, ashwagandha, holy basil, and reishi. And I'm just gonna give you a little word on each. So if you have paper and pen, like write down the ones that resonate with you. Eleuthero is the one if you have to do a lot of nighttime work, if your work requires a lot of cognitive concentration. Ginseng is if you're um, really having a lot of low immunity, you have to have a lot of physical stamina, a lot of energy to get through what you need to do. Rhodiola is particularly if you have a lot of anxiety, but not bipolar affective disorder. It's not appropriate for people with bipolar. It can affect, make it worse. Ashwagandha is the one if you're having a lot of trouble sleeping, musculoskeletal aches and pains, and also stress and anxiety. Holy basil, you can drink that. The rest of these you wanna take as either a capsule or a liquid extract, but holy basil, you can actually just take it as a tea. It's also called Tulsi. Some of you have heard of these? Yeah, good. Tulsi's relatively easy to grow in this bioregion. It's a lovely plant. Most of these actually grow. A ginseng's not that easy to grow, though. You have to have special conditions for that. But um, Tulsi is just sort of a general immune boosting, general cognitive. It's like a feel-good plant. And then reishi is if you're having a lot of immune uh, system struggles, if you're getting sick a lot, if you're the person who never gets sick but then you get sick on your first day of vacation, that one's for you too. Now, all of these herbs can help regulate your blood sugar. All of them can help with all of this stress adaptive immune system overstimulation. And they're generally safe for most people, even if you're taking pharmaceuticals, okay? But do check with your doctor first. The ginseng you want to be careful with if you have high blood pressure and the rhodiola, as I mentioned, if you have bipolar. But otherwise, they're generally safe for most people. If you're on any medications that specifically are for your immune system, like if you're taking an immunosuppressive, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, or if you're on HIV medications, then I would say check with me in the workshop this afternoon or check with your doc first. You can take them all. You can take them in combination. I usually recommend starting out with one or two. 
that feels most resonant with you, but there are products on the market that do contain many of these. Okay, the last piece I wanna say, and then I'm gonna have like one little quick bonus, is when the going gets rough, when you're feeling really stressed, when you're feeling overwhelmed, um, flip the script, okay? And what I mean by flip the script is, what we know about stress is that part of our experience of stress is our perception of stress. So if we're under stress and we're thinking, oh my God, I'm at the end of my rope, I'm really stressed out, I can't take this anymore, I gotta quit my job, I can't do this work anymore, that's your body, that's your mind telling you that you're in stress. You need to make sure that you're tending to these things, take a little recess and give yourself a break, but also flip the script. One thing that I remind myself is not that I have to do this, but I get to do this and that I want to do this. And that one little shift, that one little mind hack can make a huge difference. So next time you're in that, like, I've got this deadline, I can't take this, I hate this, remember that at some point in your life, you probably actually wanted to be doing what you're doing and you get to do it, and that can be hugely powerful. Okay, so I wanna just leave you with this thought of instead of burning out, instead of getting to the point in your life where you feel like you're going to burn out, or if you are already burnt out, really take that as a sign to just listen to your body. It doesn't mean you have to quit your work. It doesn't mean you're gonna end up with one of these diseases down the road that I talked about. But I want you to kind of keep this image of this beautiful bonfire in mind, and instead of burning out, think about being this long burning bonfire that can illuminate the world with the good work that you're doing and do it in health and happiness. Thank you.